Okay, so today we have this week and next week to finish up David. And um, today, and, and then after that, I'm going to give the tease again. We're gonna do sessions on the parables and we're, we're gonna sort of do it like the Psalms in that we're not gonna do every single parable, but we're going to do some we know and some we don't know. And so we're excited about going back to the New Testament and studying the parables. This week, um, we are going to, we are, and you're going to say, no, they're not, but we are, we're going to get through um, 20 through 24. So we're going to get through five chapters and you wonder how. 20, we're going to do like we normally do. And we're going to start that in a second because that's where we left off last week. But 21 through 24, these are four chapters that some call of them an appendix or an aside. Afterwards. At, and it is, um, David's getting older and these are taken out of chronological order. And they're like, when someone's life coming to an end or they're doing somebody's story and they say, oh, we've got to tell like four more stories and we'll just stick them here. And then next week, we're going to do first Kings chapter one and two. And that's the, the death of David and taking over by the anointing of King Solomon. So that gives you where we're going, where we left off. David was on his um, way back to Jerusalem to get back on the throne, and Absalom is dead. He has, he's realized that he can't be in mourning for, um, he, he can't be so taken over by his mourning that he's no longer the king. So he's on his way back to Jerusalem, and um, on the way, we're at Second, cha uh, second Samuel chapter 20, and um, I'll just read the, the first um, several verses. Now a worthless man named Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjaminite, happened to be there. And he blew the ram's horn and shouted, we have no share in David, no inheritance in Jesse's son. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to show Sheba, son of Bichri, to follow Sheba, son of Bichri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king all the way from, to the, from the Jordan to Jerusalem. I'm texting Jean. I'm sorry. I'm oh, okay. sure. that's, sorry. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm um, so, so, yeah, what, we, what, what happened last week in the follow-up on this, um, it's always tough, this word Israel, because obviously Abraham got that renamed Israel. And uh, then we have the nation, the entire nation of Israel, but we keep coming back in this study to the split between the Northern and the Southern kingdoms. And the Northern 10 tribes are referred to most of the time as Israel. And so it gets really confusing. Um, but, but bottom line, there was this revolt and all of these people turned against David and then David unexpectedly won and they're all trying to prove that they're the, they were, they, we really liked you all along. We're really all behind you. But this guy stands up uh, from the North. They get in this big argument. The guy stands up and says, well, we Northern tribes, we're just gonna go home. We don't want anything to do with you anymore. Um, and so it says all the men uh, of Israel, and that in this case is the 10 Northern tribes deserted David. And, and that's important to, to keep in mind. There's a lot of commentary on this, but it says what it means. They deserted David after this other uprising gets put down, right on the heels of it, the 10 Northern tribes leave David and they follow this guy, this, you know, it says a worthless man, he's a, he's a troublemaker is what he is. There's, a, there's another word, but it, it just means that he's always, he is a troublemaker but he's got enough influence that, that they all leave David and his kinfolk from Judah are the only ones to escort him back into Jerusalem. Um, then there's um, verse three, which is just sort of a, an aside. When David returned to the palace in Jerusalem, he took the 10 concubines he had left to care for the palace and he placed them in a house under guard. He provided for them but he no longer slept with them and they were confined until the day of their death, living as widows. 
So this was a good thing just to refresh everybody's memory. So David had concubines, which were like sub-level two wives, and he had 10 of them. And when he left Jerusalem, when Absalom was um, taking over, he left the 10 concubines in charge of the palace. And with the thought that, you know, if God had mercy on him and if it was God's will, he'd be back, but the concubines could take over. Absalom came to the palace and Absalom, one of the things you show that you're a king is you take over the last king's concubines. He put tents on the palace roof, the same place David stood to look for, look at Bathsheba. He put the tents on the roof and he could sleep with the 10 concubines and take over. And now David's back. And this is a nice thing David's doing, right? It, it is. And it doesn't seem like it. It really makes us kind of queasy today. But the, the, this idea of taking the, the last king's concubines, it's a, it's a sign of dominance. It's a way of saying, I, I've taken over everything that he had. And whether we understand it or not, that's what it meant to them. Uh, and and the, the, as much as I hate to say this, things like honor killing that we hear about today, this is not a new concept. He had the right uh, to have those concubines put to death for, for this. Makes no sense to us. Nonetheless, that's the way it was. David being David, um, you know, there's always a question of did they willingly participate? Did they, did they switch sides? Did they, did they go over to Absalom? But he puts them into, you know, he lets them live as if they're widows. Uh, he doesn't have anything else to do with them, but he doesn't have them put to death. Um, and, and so there's, there's that. It's hard for us, I know, but he does, it, it actually, he takes good care of them. He just sets them aside and they live like widows for the rest of their life. Um, so do you want to read from four to the end? Um, and this is the story of Sheba's rebellion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, the last thing we have to keep in mind is that David, remember Joab has killed David's son, Absalom. And uh, the, the, Joab is a nephew of David. Uh, he and his brothers are just wild men, but they're, they're, they're tough. I mean, if you, wanna, if you wanna keep a kingdom secure, they're good guys to have on your side. You sure don't want them on the other side. But after this, um, after Absalom is killed and this is over, he's, he's trying to sort of put the kingdom back together. And I think one of the signs is he makes this Amasa who had led Absalom's army. He says, I'm going to put you in charge of my army. Well, it, I think, is a rebuke to Joab for having killed David's son. But it also says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill all you people who revolted against me. And so he's, he's each, he keeps reaching out to different ones. And in this case, he tells, he says, I'm going to let the guy who led the other army be in charge of mine. So I'm putting things back together. Uh, Amasa is a relative of Joab, his, his previous military leader. Uh, I don't know if they're cousins or if Amasa's an uncle. But anyway, he gives Amasa his first job. Uh, it says that, that they get back to Jerusalem and the king said to Amasa, summon the men of Judah to come to me within three days and be here yourself. So he gives him his first job. He says, go out, put out the word, bring the men of Judah in. And Amasa is not from Judah. So it's, it's, again, trying to put these things back together. But he says, you got three days, and then I want you here in person. And that's sort of important of what's about to happen. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he took longer than the time allotted to him. Uh, and a lot of things can be, you know, can have happened. But the point is, this is an important thing. Remember this guy, Bigri, has started a new revolt. And he's taken all the people, all the men from the Sheba. 10 northern, uh, or Sheba. Sheba, pardon me, yeah, the son of Bigri, Sheba. And he's taken all the men from the northern tribes and they've gone. And he's going after them. And so it's an important thing. And he tells the, his, his new military commander, I want you to go out and raise the men of Judah, but in three days, I want, I want them here and I want you back here in person. So to not show up, you better have a good story. You better have a good reason for not being there. Um, 
And David said to Abishai, who's one, who's one of those three brothers, that's Joab's brother, because he can't go to Joab. Remember, he sort, of, he sort of demoted Joab. So he says to his brother Abishai, um, Six, yeah. yeah. Now, now Sheba, the son of Bigri, will do to do more harm to us than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, or he will find fortified cities and elude us all. So, I mean, he sees a revolt here. And he said, you know, he's just had this big fight with Absalom. And he tells this guy, he says, look, gather a bunch of people and go after this guy he's going to do more harm to us than Absalom did. And that's saying a lot, but you can see it because he's got, you know, he appears to have the support of all 10 Northern tribes and he's running back off to the North. He's going to gather people uh, and, and start a whole new, and they're all fresh off of another revolution, another revolt. He says, this is going to be terrible. Go write him down. Uh, so Joab's men, along with the Carathites and Pelathites, and all the mighty men marched out of Jerusalem to, in pursuit of Sheba, the son of Bichri. And while they were at the great stone in Gibeon, Amasa joined them. So, so uh, here's the thing, and it's hard. We don't, I don't, we, I'm not going to show on a map, but he was supposed to go to Judah to gather those men, and he didn't show up. And Judah is sort of out to the west and southwest, of Jerusalem. This place they're at, Gibeon, is north of Jerusalem. And it happens to be the, the stomping grounds of Saul. All the descendants of Saul, remember, they still resent, they still think the king should be from their tribe. So what's Amasa doing up here? And, and they, they, they see him, uh, and, and it says that um, Amasa joined them, just happened to be there. Um, now, Joab was dressed in military attire with a dagger strapped to his belt. And if you've got a different version of the Bible, it may say sword. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of mess. We'll talk about it. But this one, and that's one of the reasons I like this version. It's a, he's got a, dra a dagger strapped to his belt. And as he stepped forward, he slipped the dagger from its sheath. And if you've got a different version of the Bible, some of them actually say he dropped it, like it just happened to slip out of its, uh, the, the sword slipped out of its sheath. I'm going to tell you, if you're in battle and you've got a sheath that lets the sword slip out of it, you're in trouble. And yet these translations, it just makes me all crazy like, you know how I am. But it says that it's like the sword slipped out of its sheath. And some of them even say it fell to the ground. Uh, okay, let's keep going. So Joab walks up and asks Amasa, uh, or, or, and says, are you well, my brother? So, the, you know, it's just this kind of common greeting. How are you? I am fine. Are you well, my brother? Uh, and with his right hand, Joab grabbed Amasa by the beard to kiss him. And that's that Mediterranean kiss on both cheeks. And so you reach up, you grab the beard, you're about to give him a kiss on both cheeks. Uh, and it says Amasa was not on guard against the dagger in Joab's hand. And Joab stabbed him in the stomach and spilled out his intestines on the ground. And Joab did not need to strike him again for Amasa was dead. Then Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bichri. This is a terrible story. <laughs> and, and if you read, especially as, you know, the translations that don't get this right, or if you don't understand the geography, you think, oh, well, he just, you know, I mean, Amaz out here doing his job, and Joab comes up and kills him. But there's no reason for Amasa to be in this place. This guy Sheba is heading back up to their, their homeland, the 10, tri the 10 northern tribes. Amasa is supposed to be out gathering up the people of Judah. So we have every reason to believe Amasa is trying to help this new revolution. Joab, being Joab, the ever practical, you know, uh, powerful guy he is, 
walked up like, oh, fancy seeing you here. How are you? And I'm gonna, he's gonna give him a kiss on the cheek and he, he opens him up. Joab's good at that sort of thing. And there's a lot of speculation that Joab resented being demoted and he was trying to get rid, and that may have been part of it. It probably was, but he dispatches this guy and immediately they hit the road after uh, Sheba, the, the guy leading this new re revolt, uh, probably thinking if this guy was helping him, we got trouble. So he doesn't waste any time. But jo Joab wasn't specifically, you know, supposed to be the one leading. But Joab's a leader. That's the way it goes. Uh, and, and they take off pursuing the guy. You want to go? Um, sure. 19? Oh, no, 20. Yeah. 11. 11. 11. One of Joab's young men stood near Amasa and said, whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the road. And when the man saw that all the troops were stopping there, he dragged the body off the road into a field and threw a garment over it. As soon as Amasa's body was removed from the road, all the men went on with Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel Beth Makkah and through the entire region of the Berites, who gathered together and followed him. And Joab's troops came and besieged Sheba in Amel Bath Makkah and built a siege ramp against the outer rampart of the city. As the troops, as all the troops with Joab were battering the wall to topple it, a wise woman called out from the city, listen, listen, please tell Joab to come here so that I may speak with him. When he had come to, nearer to her, the woman asked, are you Joab? I am, he replied. Listen to the words of your servant, she said. I'm listening, he answered. Then the woman said, woman said, long ago, they used to say, seek counsel at Abel. And that is how disputes were settled. I'm among the peaceable and faithful in Israel, but you're trying to destroy a city that is a, mo is a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Far be it, Joab declared. Far be it from me to swallow up or destroy. That is not the case. But a, man, but a man named Sheba, son of Bichri, from the hill country of Ephraim, has lifted up his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him alone, and I will depart from the city. Look, the woman replied, his head will be thrown over to you, over the wall. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise counsel, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he blew the ram's horn, and his men dispersed from the city, each to his own home. And Joab returned to the king in Jerusalem. Yeah, and the last part is just telling you who's who here. So, so Joab, and again, remember, David sent Abishai, Joab's brother. Joab is no longer in charge. And the guy who is in charge, Joab kills him. I mean, just walks up and dispatches him. And all the men are looking because this is the guy who was in charge of the army. And, and Joab just killed him. And I'm sure they're trying to figure out what are we supposed to do? Uh, and one of the men faithful to Joab said, you know, yells out, all, any of you who, are, who, who support Joab and David, so what he does is he's basically saying, if you support David, if, you, if you're if you here to support the king, follow Joab. So Joab is back in charge uh, and he's got his men well-trained. I mean, it was a very astute thing to do. Uh, and they just, they tossed the body off the road because the guys were sitting there looking at this. And I'm sure they're thinking, you know, that could be me. I mean, if I do some little wrong thing, that could be me. So they just toss the body and they say, we got a job to do and off they go. And it says that this guy Sheba heads off to this city, this walled city, Abel Bet Makkah. Um, and that's what David said he feared was that this guy would dig in somewhere. And if you don't get him, then he's going to eventually raise more people and they've got another war on their hands but an aside when he first 
said, you know, we're not going to follow David anymore. It said all the people basically of the northern tribe are following him. When they go to this walled city, it's just whoever they say is following him is basically just his clan. So he he isn't, he's no David. He doesn't have a following like David. I mean, people said, yeah, we're going to be against David. But when when it comes down to it, it was just a few people. And that's, that's in that human behavior. Everybody, everybody leaves with this guy. Yeah, rah, rah, we're on, you know, yes, we'll follow you. And then they just sort of drift off to their homes. Nobody really wants to get in a, in a, you know, war with David. Now, given time, this guy could probably get support and they'd have to put down this uprising. But he travels through these northern kingdoms and it's really only his own clan, his own group that are with him. And they go into this walled city and Joab and the men of, of um, Judah are hot on their heels. And so they come to the walled city and the people inside there, you can just imagine, they didn't ask for this. And I'm sure this Sheba and his men came in as soldiers, made them lock the gate, secure everything. They didn't ask for this. And so they're outside preparing to start this siege of the city. And a woman comes and, and from the city and, and to, to talk to Joab. And sometimes I, I think this is also confusing to people, but, but she's, she's, Joab knows what she's doing. That's the thing you have to keep in mind as you read this. You can tell there's sort of a, of a, of a form in you know, that part of the world in that time for how these conversations go. But she says, uh, uh, well, she says, are you Joab? And he, he says, I am. I always like that the way that, but, but she says, listen to the words of your servant. And you hear that term a lot. Instead of saying, listen to my words, it's always listen to the word of your servant. So they humble themselves and say, you know, they're saying, she's saying, listen to me. And she's, and, and so she says, long ago, people used to say, if you want to settle a dispute, come to that city and ask for advice. So there were people, they were sort of known as being a level-headed, wise bunch of people. And she's known as being a wise woman within this town. And she says, this place has a reputation. And it's, she says, it's a mother. So this is a city that's been around a long time. They do good things there. They're, why would you want to destroy God's inheritance by bringing down this city? And Joab, I love this, far be it from me to cause destruction. This is Joab, remember? <laughs> far be it from me to cause destruction. But what he's really saying is, he says, look, I don't want to do it. And, and he knows what she's getting at. He knows where she's going. So this is all a dance. He says, I, I don't want to tear down your city. But there's this guy who has taken up refuge in there as if they didn't know that. And he says, deliver him to me. And he doesn't even say deliver all of his men because he knows this is the guy is the problem child deliver him to me and we'll leave all of you alone. And that's obviously what she had in mind. And she goes back and tells the rest of the people of the city, uh, if we don't give this guy up, there's an army coming in and we're all gonna suffer for it. And we didn't ask him to come in. He came in here and forced himself in and made us lock the gates. And so the people of the city get together and kill this guy. And you notice this bit about throwing the head over the wall. It's gross. But also what she's saying is, we're not opening the gates to you. All right. We're not going to, just in case you might be inclined to punish us for having him in here, you're going to have to earn it. So if you were serious, we're going to give you proof that he's dead, but we're not opening up the gates. And they do this thing. They throw the head over the wall. And uh, Joab says, yep, fine, I'm good. And everybody departs and goes home. But this is the end of a, of a really, I mean, this really ugly time with Absalom's revolt and having to put that down and so many people changing sides and the death of the king's son. And then immediately on the heels of that, this other guy, and, and it, he's hitting them at a time where they're weak. They've already proven, Absalom has proven 
that people will take someone else's side given the opportunity. And this guy I, is thinking, I'm going to take advantage of that. Uh, and, and so, you know, David's reputation, though, has been with him for so long. You remember times where the Philistines don't want any part of fighting David because he has a reputation of winning. And then he gets kicked out of his own city and from out in exile, he puts down the, the, the other army. He puts down the revolt. People are in no hurry to go to war with David. Uh, and, and, and so a lot of those people desert this guy. It probably sounded like a good idea when they were all angry, when they were being insulted. Remember that little argument at the riverside? It probably sounded like a good idea. And as they're heading off, they start thinking, we're back at war with David. And we remember what just happened to us when we went to war with David. So, so one thing before we move on to the next chapters is, you know, we read the thing about the concubines. We always think in the Old Testament how women are treated and, you know, second class citizens, obviously. And, you know, I mean, I understand all that. But during this um, story of David, we have heard wise women. I think this is the third wise woman. I was trying to think who the second one was, but the first one was Abigail. And these are women that have something gutsy to say, and they are listened to. It's easily overlooked. It's a good point. They clearly are respected. Uh, their advice is followed. Uh, they aren't just tuned out because they're women. And she's the one that this town has represented them. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. And it's probably worthy of a class in and of itself. But that's a, that's a good point. Now, can I, real quick. So, so this has been history. This last bit. The, the big things you should, we should see out of this is David is old. David is, as I said last week, he's a lion in winter. He's still David, but he's old and he's coming to the end. And I think, you know, we're going to see that people recognize it. And, and teaching pure history is tough. There's not a lot of lessons. Uh, you have to dig to get lessons out of this. And so I, I kind of, in some ways, I don't like doing this in a class, but I think maybe overall it helps our understanding of the, of the Old Testament, some of the stuff that went on. So as I said, we're going to look at chapters 21 through 24, and we're not going to read, we will invite you to read them on your own if you're interested, but we're going to sort of summarize what they are, because um, these are um, confusing, there are some yucky stories, it, they're, not they're not chronological, Etc. So I'm going to what, try what, what this is, these last three chapters, this four. is our four chapters. This is basically a, a way of sort of wrapping up David's story in this book of Samuel. They tell, a, you know, a lot about his, his, his mighty men. Uh, these are just sort of, these are just sort of some collected tales that we think you, you know, whoever wrote this thinks you ought to know, but, but because they're all out of chronological order, it's really confusing, and I we don't want to we don't want to beat this to death. So I'm gonna see if I can do 21 in five minutes. So 21 has two stories. The first part of the story is the Gibbon, Gibeonites. There is this um, famine that lasts three years, and um, and so this doesn't happen right after sh this revolt of Sheba. This has happened decades before they believe. So anyhow, there's this there's this famine. And um, David goes to God and says, what can I do? Why is this happening? What can I do to stop it? And he says, the reason this is happening is because Saul broke a covenant with the Gibeonites. And as Scott says, this is a sort of a complicated story. I'm going to see if I can do it short. So but way back when they came into the promised land, um, Joshua got tricked by the Gibeonites in making a covenant with them. And they said, you know, don't kill us. And they, the Gibeonites became um, worker bees basically for, for Joshua and his people. And they, and they promised not to kill them. Somewhere along the lines, and it's never talked about in either first or second Samuel or Chronicles, Saul did what Saul did and he, did, he broke the covenant and he tried to kill all the Gibeonites. And as such now, he says, you know, 
Saul broke a covenant with the Gibeonites, and as such, that covenant's been broken, and the only, and he says, that's why there's famine. So David goes to the Gibeonites and says, what can I do? And the Gibeonites says, we don't need your money, but what we want for repu um, reparations. reparations is we want you to kill seven. Not to kill, to deliver to us seven men from Saul's family. So David's got a problem, you know, so they, he knows they're going to put him to death. So seven men. So he's also got a covenant he promised. He promised Jonathan he would not kill off his line. So he cannot deliver. And Mephibosheth. I hate that name. Um, Mephibosheth. <laughs> and he can't deliver him, but he delivers seven of Saul's um, sons. Two of them was with a concubine. Um, and five was with somebody five. else. Yeah. And so they get, deliver them to the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites kill them. Um, it doesn't exactly say how. They hang their bodies up on the street, uh, up on the walls. And the concubine, the mother who was a concubine, sits there for like a month guarding the bodies that are rotting so they're not attacked by animals. David sees this and because he feels so bad or he feels that it's not right, he goes and gets not only Saul's bones and Jonathan's remains, but also all these seven sons of Saul and buries them all together. Gives them a proper burial. And when the mother who sat there for a month sits there guarding the bodies, it says rain comes. So the famine is over. So it's a bizarre story. Story one. Story two. <laughs> Just, I there has to be something or else we don't need to tell this. There has to be, there has to be something that people can, can get from this. One of the one of the lessons, one of what the things that you get, these covenants are often made sort of in the sight of God. Like I, I you know, as God is my witness, we'll let you live here. And they're not to be undertaken lightly. And and what you what you see is that because they made this covenant as God's people. And then Saul turns back on it. He's, he says, and, and there's a lot of speculation for why, but Saul is Saul breaks the covenant and he kills a number of them and he proposes to kill the rest and he gets short, you know, stopped. But but you make a covenant with somebody and you, you know, you make this oath binding to God, and then you go back on it, there are consequences. And it also shows you that the, the, the shepherd, the king, uh, he's responsible for the country, but the country suffers when the king doesn't follow God's law. And that's what's happened here. Uh, it can't be overlooked that the, the king did this, did this thing and the people suffered. And if you remember, they were warned about this. The people got, you know, they, they weren't supposed to even have a king. And finally, they, you know, he said through, through Samuel, all right, I'm going to give you a king, but I'm going to warn you right now. If you don't follow my law, there will be consequences. And this is what happens. Saul does this thing and the people suffer. This idea of famine, you people have this idea that all the green things turn to sand. There is no food. How do they even live three years? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's three years where things are not productive and it gets their attention. One year like that is a bad year. But after three, David says something's wrong here. And he goes to God and says, what's, what's going on? And, and this is what we hear. He got their attention with this, this low production of crops. Uh, and it's because there's unfinished business. So the second half of 21 shows the story of another Philistine attack. The battles with the Philistines. And again, we don't really know when this is. This is later in his life because the important part about the second part of chapter 21 is um, starting at uh, verse 17. But Abishai, son of Zerai, came to his aid, struck the Philistine and killed him. David was about to be killed by one of the Philistines. And it says, then David men, David's men swore to him, you must never again go out with us to battle so that the lamp of Israel may not be extinguished. And so it is believed that this is, David has gotten too old to go out to battle now and David 
listened and didn't go out to we, we, well but again we need to talk about that part of the story you've got to understand why this is included for a reason and we this is showing us that david is now coming to the end david has been this warrior his whole life and there's there there's this area where there are these people that are just big you know, we want to talk about giants. It's not Jack and the Beanstalk giants, but they're big, big guys like Goliath was. And David, there are a few younger people, but we also have a number of us who are, you know, my age and older. Do any of you still feel like you're you're a lot younger than you are? Like, I feel like I could go out and, you know, run down a car, but I can't really run anymore. And and you, you your body, your, your brain says, I'm still capable of doing all this stuff. And your body says no. Well, they get into a situation. There's one of these enormous guys, and David, being David, is going to take him on on his own. And Abishai has to come to his rescue. If he hadn't, David would be dead. And it, it's because David still thinks he can pull this stuff off. And so his men come to him and go, "Look, this you can never go out into battle with us again. It's over. You're too old." And you're important. If you die, then, then you're more important as, as the king that keeps the kingdom together. We can handle the battles. You need to stay place and stay put in Jerusalem. So you get this image. David is coming to the end. And he's now reached a point where he's not the warrior that he once was. Uh, and his own men tell him, yeah, no more. 2 Samuel 22 is the same as Psalm 18. And, this, and Psalm 18 is believed it was written um, after David becomes king, after he battles a lot of the foreign um, threats, but before he goes on the roof and has his um, thing with Bathsheba. So that's when Psalm 22, I mean, Psalm 18 was written. And, and this is almost word for word, the same as Psalm 22. I mean, uh, Psalm 18, verse chapter 22, is, sorry. Blah. But the reason they did this here, I think, is once again, they're recapping David's life. But this is, this is a psalm written from a younger man's standpoint, and it, it did not go through. So this psalm, it, 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 you know, you see it in the Psalms, and they throw it in here, but the reason being, this is written by David, and this is David at his absolute peak. This is David when he's young, he's strong, and he's not done the thing with Bathsheba. And so they throw this in to, to, to show you what who David was when, when he was at his absolute prime. And you look at how it starts out. You wanna know about David, you want to know about he's a man after God's own heart. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. That's David. He, he, he gives God credit for, for all of this success. Uh, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold, my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. Uh, you know, you can go on. I would recommend it. We, you know, we looked at these when we did the Psalms, but that's why it's thrown in. This, this is David at his absolute best. So it's a good Psalm to read. And then you go right on to 2 Samuel 23. And in most Bibles, it says David's last Psalm. So the first part of chapters 23 is another song and it's the last song of David. And it goes up to, to verse seven, but first, um, and and this is later in his in his life. And then it goes to check. It goes to verse eight, and it talks about the mighty men. And this lists the names of David's mighty men. You can see David perhaps like at the palace, and he's getting a historian, and he wants to write down all his mighty men. And they talk about. 30 mighty men. And if you go to the end of it, they list 37. So things like that always make me crazy. They say 30 mighty men and they list 37. It's because some of them got killed and got replaced. It's nothing more complicated yeah. than that. And so it goes through these 30 mighty men, which were people that helped David defeat all these people during his lifetime. 
and and talks about how, you know he killed eight hundred, he killed two thousand. Oh, you, know. you had to throw that in no, there. You had well, to. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> If you read this, if you have read it, and, and, and as Mary said, this is sort of recapping David's life. And David had these 30 at any given time, these 30, they called mighty men. And they were, they were champions of the army. They, they were, you know, leaders. And each one of them had some things that they did that, that, you know, and it's, this is not surprising that this is in here. The Vikings would, they had, they had uh, uh, people who would make songs about heroes. They would tell their mighty deeds. Well, that's what this is. And so it's sort of a recap of these mighty men that were with David through his reign. This is, the, this is part of the story. And if you read it on your own, uh, because we're not going to, uh, it, it's confusing if you take some of this stuff literally, um, it was never intended to be that. This is sort of, you know, a tale of David's, mind, David's mighty men. But they do things like when, when the rest of the, the, the troops sort of run away and this one guy stands and he stands up against all of these enemy soldiers. And it, it sounds sort of ridiculous unless you remember Goliath. Goliath basically held off the entire Israel army by himself because he's issuing a challenge and nobody wants to be the first one to go out there and meet Goliath because you're gonna go down. You're gonna, I mean, nobody wants to do that. And it, it, it gets done in this way the only, the only answer is to, well, we send out our champion, we send out our best guy. And what happens when your best guy goes down? The rest of them are going, well, he is a lot tougher than, than me and look what happened to him. And, and so th this is a story about these, um, these guys that do these amazing feats of bravery and, and obviously fighting. Um, and, and, you know, we're not going to go into the only one I want to go. I want to go to the very last verse because we actually listened to a whole sermon on the last verse of second Samuel 23 verse, um, 39 and Uriah, the Hittite, Uriah, the Hittite, when, when David is listing his mighty men, the last one he put there, and it's no accidents probably last because it's so you'll remember it, was Uriah. Uriah was Bathsheba's husband. Uriah was that horrible story where he put him, he gave Uriah his own death notice to go out to Joab to make sure he got killed. And this is one of those stories you think, you know, David is probably close to 70 years old or 69, he dies at 70, but he's, he's later in his years and he's recalling his history and he's saying, these are all my great men. And one of my great men was Uriah. And this is this sermon, you know, and it's speculation that they said, you know, as the historians are writing this down, they say to David, oh, you know, you don't need to list him. You know, you've done so many great things. You don't need to put Uriah. But David put Uriah. David didn't, didn't lie to himself or to God or to the people that he was some perfect person. He wasn't a perfect person. He knew it. And Uriah was one of his men and he was a great man, man and he put him to death unjustly. And he lets that know. It, it's it's got to be a hard thing to do. And again, this is David coming to the end of his life and he's laying out, the, the, he's giving recognition so it's like the Oscars. You get up to the microphone and you tell everybody, and I want to thank the director and the producer and all the people who helped me get this. I mean, he's, he's listing all these men that have been with him for all of this time. And as Mary said, he gets to the end of the list and it's conspicuous because if you read these verses, there's a whole list of these men, these, these you know, turns out 37 mighty men that have served him. And they're the captains of his armies. Uh, and he gets to the end of the list and he throws in Uriah. And everyone knows by now, because remember, David wrote a song about his guilt, about what he had done. 
And I'm sure people did the math when Bathsheba gives birth and it's the, they say, how many, you know, isn't that what people do? One, two, three, <laughs> four, five. Oh, something doesn't add up here, right? So everybody understands what David did. He didn't hide it. He didn't, he didn't lie about it. And then to get at this point in his life and he's remembering these, these men who, who, you know, helped him win all these battles. And the very last one he throws in is this guy that, that he had killed. Uh, and it's, a, it, it's an amazing thing about David. If we're going to learn a lesson, if we're going to read this, and I think we always should try to, we should try and take things and say, well, you know, what can, how can, I, I read David's a man after God's own heart. And I think, well, I want to be that. I, I, you know, that sounds like something I would like to be remembered as. This is a good example. This is David taking responsibility, giving credit to Uriah when the easiest thing would be to just let his name die out. And David refuses to do that. David takes the shame because Uriah, he says, deserves to be recognized. It's a good lesson. I mean, that's the sort of thing that, that David does right up until the very end that sets him apart. Most people would do anything they could to make that story go away. Uh, you know, start a war uh, to cover up for something you've done wrong. We see people doing that today. And, and David just stands up and admits it. The last chapter of 2 Samuel is another bizarre story. And it's David's military senses is how it's highlighted. Do you want to, you have, we have 10 yeah. minutes to highlight the story. Well, it's not going to take 10 minutes, but I'll highlight it. So it says that Israel, God was, was displeased with Israel yet again. He was stirred up against them. We don't know what they've done. And the truth is, we don't know if it's the 10 northern tribes or if it's the entire nation. That's one of the, that's one of the things about Hebrew that, that you know, is a problem. Sometimes we, we aren't quite sure, but God is upset with his people. And he stirs David up and he says, I want you to take a census. God tells David that. God tells David that. And David calls Joab and tells him, I want you to go out and do this thing. I want you to go take this census. And Joab says, um, you know, I hope God has multiplied the people a hundredfold. And you may find that to be true. But why would you want to do this? Why would you want to do this thing? And we must, Mary and I must have listened to, I don't know how many commentaries this week, how many sermons on this. And I had to spend a lot of time with it because it doesn't make sense. Joab argues, and David says, no, you're going to do what I told you, and he sends them out, and they start up in the north and work their way all the way down, and they count all the people, and he comes back, Joab comes back with these guys with him to give David the count, and he tells him there are, you know, 700,000 men who draw the sword. There's 700,000 grown men in the north and 500,000 grown men in the south. And David immediately jumps in and says, stop right there. He says, I've done wrong. I've, I've done, I've sinned in the eyes of the Lord. And his, his prophet, these kings always have their own prophet assigned to them. His prophet comes in, yeah. Gad, and tells him, yeah, God told me you've messed up. You're in trouble. And he says, I'm going to give you a choice between three years of famine, three months of being on the run from your enemies. <clears throat> and that's not right. Yeah, three years, three months, or, or three days of uh, plague in the land. And this appears to be a, a, a thing you, that sounds so odd, but all the way back to Moses, there's this thing about when the people don't follow the covenant, that one of these three things is going to happen. So it's not inconsistent. It's strange. And David says, you know, three years of famine hurts the whole country. He didn't spell this out, but that's what's going on. 
And then to be on the run for three months from his enemies means that some enemies who are strong enough sweep into the country and run him out of Jerusalem. And then the whole nation is going to suffer over that. I mean, there are going to be people. And But the other thing he says that's, that's important, he says, I would rather take my chances being handed over to God and trusting his mercy. The Lord Yahweh is merciful. So the three days, he says, you know, of plague, I'm trusting that God will be more merciful than men. So, so don't hand me over to men because I don't, they're not merciful people. I trust God to be merciful. <clears throat> and there's this famine in the land. And David repents uh, and, and, and God tells him through the prophet, I want you to go to this threshing floor. And, and make a sacrifice there. I want you to set up an altar to me at this certain place and make a sacrifice. And so I'm going to now tell you a few things that are important about this story. For starters, when God tells David to count the people to do a census, and usually a census is either for the purpose of collecting taxes or raising an army or both. But there's a word, there's a Hebrew word, uh, Hama, and then David comes up and does a different thing. And if you don't go back to the Hebrew, this is horribly confusing because we don't have words that mean different things. And I don't know for sure yet. I, 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 I don't know if he was supposed to do something since God was angry that would, that would send a message to them, something that was sort of punitive. And instead, he decides just to count. That's sort of what I think happened. So he didn't collect the tax. He just registered or counted them. And so it's sort of like the, the Ark story. He, he did, you know, he was doing something good bringing in the Ark. He didn't do it the right way. He did not do the census the right way. Yep. He was told to do one thing and he did another. And when Joab comes back with the count, David says, you know, I messed up doesn't matter now because what I did is something I shouldn't have done <clears throat> and they get in trouble and there comes this three days of plague 70,000 people die uh, again this is strange to us but what is important is he was then told go to this guy's threshing floor and set up an altar there and David goes to the man <clears throat> and he says I want to buy your threshing floor and the guy says, why? He says, I'm supposed to set up an altar to God. And he says, look, and, and the guy's one of these foreigners. He's one of these protected foreigners. But he says, look, if that's what it's for, I'll give it to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not going to charge you for this. I'll give you the threshing floor. And David says, no, I'm not going to sacrifice something to God that didn't cost me anything. There's a lesson there. This is supposed to be a, you know, this is supposed to be an altar and a sacrifice. And David says, if it doesn't cost anything, it's not a sacrifice. So here's an aside. A lot of ministers do sermons to collect money this way because they say, um, do you give money to the church? Yes. Well, does it really hurt? If it doesn't hurt, it's not a sacrifice. So anyhow, we listen to a lot of sermons. It, on it is. Those, <laughs> are fun. This is a fundraising, <laughs> fundraising tool. Right. Um, but, but anyway, here's the point. And this is, we're, we're pretty much done anyway. But here's the point of this. This thing that he buys, this, this piece of land where he sets up this altar, then becomes the site of the temple. Had all of this not happened, the temple would not have been where it is because it belonged to someone else. And so the people that were first hearing these stories knew this story, knew that this, this is Mount Moriah, knew that this was the, the, the place, threshing floor. the threshing floor, and this is where Solomon built the temple, which is the next part of the story. But for us who read it and else we go do a deep dive, you never know that that's there. And so we have, this is one of the things that, that I want to try and leave you with out of this story. We often have situations where we go, well, you know, if that hadn't happened, that terrible thing hadn't happened and led to this next terrible thing that happened, I wouldn't have wound up where I was. Mary and I would never have met. 
if not for one terrible thing followed by another terrible thing. Uh, that's just a fact. That's just the way it is. I say I can't see any other possibility that at that particular time um, I, I, we would have met. And it, and, it, and it gets, when it says God works all things together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Uh, I, I, I often say that, that the biggest train wrecks in my life have been the exact amount of force that was needed to push me from where I was to where I needed to be. Uh, and so what we see in the story of David, it's this terrible thing, but it winds up being there's no other reason David goes out and purchases this piece of land and the temple winds up where it winds up at, you know, on Mount Moriah. Uh, and so regardless of whether the, the, the history is good, it gets used in a way that turns out to be extremely important. Um, that's the close of 2 Samuel. You might notice this is 2 Samuel, and Samuel has been dead for a long, long time. So, you know, you wonder why it is, but it's just, it's a continuation of this story that Samuel oh, I told Scott, there's like, should have been a book of David for Pete's <laughs> sake. You know, there's no book of David. There's no book of Solomon. There's, you know, first and second Kings, I guess that's Solomon. But yeah, Samuel got two books and he was not, you know, anyhow. Um, so next week, we're going to do first Kings verse, um, chapters one and two, but we're also going to see since the sound system is better and we're wrapping up David, we want, we, we're going to, um, and I hate um, when people call on me and I don't even know they're going to call on me. So next week, we're going to not mute everybody. And we want you to think about as we, I mean, because we've studied David probably for 15, six, 16 weeks or something, you know, two questions. First of all, you know, when you hear the phrase now, um, David is a man after God's own heart, what did you, I mean, did you have a new reason to believe that? What is the reason you believe God is a man after, David's a man after God's own heart? And as- This is an assignment. If, she, if she's not clear here, <laughs> pay attention. This is an assignment. We're gonna ask questions next week. And the second one is, you know, as Scott says, you know, what is, what could, difference going to make in your life? How can I say that better? Yeah, what, how do, what, applies, what applies to these lessons of David? Did anything stand out to you as something that you might apply? So this COVID thing is hard. It, it, this, this thing of having people on Zoom is hard. It's hard on me. When we go into the parables, it really lends itself to discussion. And we are going to have to learn together some new tricks. Uh, when we're studying directly out of the Bible and directly out of the Old Testament, I sort of feel this obligation to, to teach it because there's a lot of history and there are a lot of things that, that you know, everybody doesn't know. And, and it's less, when we're doing this, it's less about how do you feel about it than, than I think we need to learn what's there. But now we move into the parables, and I just think it's vital that we have conversation. I really do. And I don't know how to do it. If you have suggestions, email us or call us or do something. But I, I really hope we can, we can do this in a way that we can have some more conversation about it. The parables are, are an odd thing because they are they're messages that are not spelled out for us. And they're done that way intentionally. And so it, to get to the message, uh, sometimes we get insight from, from each other. So be thinking about that. And as Mary said, next week, we're going to try and see if we can do this and, and see how the discussion works. And, and if I need to make more adjustments on the sound system, I will. Prayer. Prayer. God, we see in this life of David uh, so many examples for us, good and bad, things to do and things to avoid. And we know through the whole thing, we see the, the, the concept of, of said. we see mercy, uh, we see this kindness dished out. And we, we pray, God, that you remind us of that, that, that you, you show us 
your mercy, your kindness, but you put it in our hearts to remember to do those same things, to show, to show that same has said to the people around us. Uh, be with those that we prayed for earlier. We're concerned about Gene right now, but the others, Cindy and Paul are with us. God, be with them. This is just such a tough time. Be with us this week as we go into this last study on David uh, that we were able to seek out and find those lessons that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can unmute yourself. I'm going to do something according to the